Hi, friends. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we can't thank you guys enough for helping us grow the Ray and Benny channel. Uh, thank you for subscribing. Thank you for following. If you haven't, go ahead and smash that subscribe button down below. Thank you very much for your help. It helps the channel grow, helps them get the word out. Benny, where can they find us on social media? Yeah, you can find us, Ray Benny Sports. We're on Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, Instagram. Check us out also on Discord and Reddit and leave us a rating on your favorite podcast provider. We got Bomber Talk, we got Jets Talk, and we got our hot shots. But let's start off with Winnipeg Blue Bomber Talk, brought to you by Fahrenheit Airbrushing. Stand out on the ice, pavement, or on the field, or in the stands with a custom airbrushed helmet, goalie mask, or any project. A local Manitoba business with affordable solutions for any project. Check out Fahrenheit Airbrushing on Facebook or call them at 204-891-7431. And don't forget, tell them Ray and Benny sent you. The bombers are a few hours away. <laughs> More than a few hours away. 48 They're hours. hours away. Less than uh, 48 hours. And I can't wait. <laughs> um, the odds makers have the bombers as favorites uh, to win the West and to win the Cup. Is your outlook as optimistic as the odd makers? I'm going to say no, but. I don't think they're far off. I got to see the Bombers first. I, I don't know what to make of this defense yet. I feel the offense is going to be fine. And I feel like the offense is going to have to probably carry the load early in the season. The defense kind of worries me. Um, just with a bunch of new guys on the D-line. Big Hill being out. So while I do think the Bombers have a great chance of making it to the uh, Great Cup and winning the Great Cup, uh, I need to see it first. So I'm going to say no right now that my optimistic, my optimism is not the same as the odd makers. You know, I love the Bombers. I'm live and die through the blood. First team I've known and loved. Uh, but with that said, I don't think the Bombers, through transactions or whatever, in the offseason necessarily got better. And that's not to say they're not going to be a contender. They won't be in the they will be in the battle for the cup without a doubt come season end. I'm just concerned that they did not do enough in the offseason. Uh, to address the inconsistencies that were that they had at the end of the season and in the Grey Cup. I'm still concerned about the trenches going into the season on both sides, among other holes in the roster that we're going to go uh, over. Uh, they're going into the new season with new coordinators, with Jordan Younger and Mike Miller, who have never called the shots before. And they have great mentors with Richie Hall and Coach O'Shea, who are great coordinators and special teams and defensively, respectively. They've lost locker room leaders in Rashid Bailey and Jamarcus Hardrick. And I personally see Montreal, the defending champions, being the odds-on favorite to win the Grey Cup. I guess I shouldn't say odds-on because I'm not really using odds as my personal favorite to win the Grey Cup. They have more roster consistency. They're bringing back 19 out of 24. They lost Austin Mack, but they brought in Tevin Jones from Saskatchewan. And I think he's a great compliment for Philpott if Philpott takes the next step forward off of his Grey Cup success. He has momentum coming off of that. And their defensive line actually might have gotten better. You know, they brought in guys like Berglund, Wigan, and Wynn, and they still have Sean Lemon, which we'll talk about in a second, and they often overlook Mustafa Johnson. I think they're in a better position to repeat than the Argos were a couple years ago or the year before. They went out and they got better, I think. Uh, and the Bombers really need two to three or three or four players to step up in those big shoes that are left open. Maybe not play exactly like other players have, like Habba, Celestin Habba, Shane Goche, Terrell Bonds. We need guys like that to step up. And I'm not saying, oh, they have to be the next Demero Houston. He has to be Big Hill, and he has to be Jackson Jeffcoat. But they do definitely have to step up and fill those shoes for the Bombers still to be competitive come the end of the year. Yeah, I will say, though, Montreal did cut Tevin Jones. So, oh, did they really? Yeah, they, they kept I totally a missed that. They kept a rookie over him. I can't remember the guy's name, but that's huge. Yeah, so he got cut. So yeah, Montreal's running game still is up in the air for me. Um, so we'll see how that does. But I do agree with you in terms of Montreal. That defense is coming back. Uh, it's a solid D. It finished that season strong. So we'll see if they can continue on and if Fajardo could build off that great cop game. But yeah, yeah, too many questions right now for the Bombers for me. And I'd like to see at least you know, a few games and to see where they're at. And like you say, uh, you're without Big Hill for, uh, you know, who knows, six games maybe, maybe more, maybe less. Uh, Cam Lawson out. Uh, Jamal Parker isn't playing um, at least this week or the next possibly couple weeks. So, yeah, you got new guys, Terrell Bonds, 
uh, Tyrell Ford. How are they going to do out, out uh, uh, you know, at the cornerback position? Uh, new D line, and then Shane Goche is going to be able to bring somewhat the same kind of level as Big Hill. Probably not the same, obviously, right? Because you can't replace Big Hill uh, one for one like that. So Hall of Famer plus the special teams, like you say, Mike Come Miller. On, uh, special teams last year we couldn't cover pretty much anyone. Uh, everyone was pretty much in uh, field goal range or close to field goal range by the time they returned the ball. So, and then uh, our own return game, who's going to be, you know, there's still question marks there. So we'll see. Um, not enough questions are probably going to be answered this Thursday. And I think it's going to be a top game with Montreal to start things off, but yeah. I- I'm still optimistic on the season going well for the Bombers. Absolutely. They're, they're going to be challenging like said, for that West definitely. division and making these playoffs. Right. And then again, we've talked about father time. Will it catch up to some of these guys or not? Um, but yeah, we'll see. Going into the game, uh, what position are you most excited to watch? I'm going to say the backfield, and I'm going to see say specifically how they use Chris Strebler in the backfield. Ever since they signed him, I've been excited about the Strevy package, how they use him, possible Wildcats, dual QB, goal line, wishbone. Man, all these old school formations come into play. And of course, the possible Strebler Oliveira option plays that are available when they're both in the game. So... I'm excited to see Strebler play. I think he's going to bring an energy that, you know, like I, like I said, you can't replace Jamarcus Hardrick and you can't place, re- replace Rasheed Bailey. But he was something special when he was with the Bombers. The uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> he brings a swagger and an attitude that leads the rest of the team. He leads by play, not just the fur coat and the, and the hilarious interviews. You know what I'm saying? He leads by energy on the field. So I'm excited to watch him play. Damn, I should have went first on that one because I have the exact same thing. Uh, and it's the QB running back position of seeing what they're going to do with Strebler on the field, what they're going to do with, between him and Brady Oliveira on the field at the same time. Who are you going to pick? Who are you going to cover? Who are they going to uh, hand it off to? Or is Strebler going to keep it? And then you still got the option of Strebler throwing it, right? So of course. It, it's going to be fun to watch, and I'm excited to see what wrinkles uh, they're going to do there. And yeah, like you say, Strebler is a good opportunity to replace Hardrick's enthusiasm after plays. Like, how many times did Strebler get up back in 2019 after a big play and was just pumped? I mean, the dude was, what, was he playing off a, on a broken ankle, right? Yeah. Like, and he still brought it and the intensity. Absolutely. So, yeah, I'm definitely excited to see what they can do there. And, hey, this is a big step for um, Buck Pierce to show what he can do offensively with, with all these weapons. Right, because you got four good receivers coming back again. You got yes, you got new guys on the O line. Um, so we'll see what they can do, especially at right tackle with Eric Lofton, uh, if he's going to be able to play. Again, you're not replacing Jamarcus Hardrick, like you're not replacing. Bingo, no, you but, can't. But you Lofton, can't. He's hopefully, too big he can of a bring factor on this roster. No, you can't. Yeah, so we'll see it. I mean, I'm I'm excited. What position are you mo- are you most worried about? D line, um, you know, Salston Hab is going to be the guy, uh, and there's not a lot of depth right now at that defensive end position because um, t- Taiwan Garbage is out; he's hurt. Um, so is Haba going to be playing the full game? Plus, then you got uh, in the middle, you're going to have a new guy, uh, Miles Fox, right? Possibly on that DT spot alongside Jake Thomas, who the depth behind him is a lot of new guys. So if Thomas struggles to to make impact in the game. Uh, is Tanner Schmeckel or whoever is going to be back around? Because we don't know the depth chart yet. So we don't know who's who's position-wise there. So yep. it's going to be interesting to see. Uh, it, 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 you know the CFL, right? Without a pass rush and a, and a good D-line, you struggle no matter what because there's a lot of field to cover. And these DBs, are help, you know, you can't give these quarterbacks a lot of time because these DBs will struggle to cover. So, yeah, the D-line for me is the position I'm worried about. I'm also concerned about the D-line. I'm not as concerned about the Canadian depth. I'm pretty happy with Jake Thomas as the plug there uh, in his third, 14th year. I'm scared if he gets hurt, that's all. Uh, and I really like what I see from Schmeckel. He definitely held his own. He can be a plug in there. It's about the American rotation, Fox, Woods, and possibly Miles. Uh, it's about keeping those guys fresh, you know? And um, I-, I think they'll be okay. You know, you still got Willie Jefferson, obviously, on the other side, who's still probably top five dangerous defensive player in the league. Yep. Oh, yeah. Like, I, I'd say so. So, yeah, those new guys have definitely got to step up, like we talked about earlier. But, yeah, that American rotation of Fox, Wood, and Miles. Woods and Miles. Uh, I'm, I just want to see how they work out. 
it could could add a lot of pressure too on that linebacking core, especially without Big Hill. Um, we'll see who starts there. Is it going to be Goche? Uh, we we'll probably get the depth chart tomorrow, kind of thing, right? So yeah, that D line, especially that middle, kind of struggled last year against the run um, in in a bunch of games. So are they going to be okay now that you don't have Big Hill back there to kind of back them up? And Big Hill did struggle at times too in the run game last year. So. Yeah, that'll be another spot where we'll see if this defense could show up and see if Jordan Younger can put a great spin on it um, and fix some of the issues they had last year. Yes, but but to be clear, they're still one of the best teams against the run in the league. Oh, for sure. Yes, they like, had, they it, just had games it's always where they're exacerbated like, Whoa. against the Bombers when you see teams start running against them, especially Calgary when they did have the opportunity <laughs> to possibly get the run going. You saw Edmonton get the run going a little bit, and Ottawa, but with Dustin Crum when he went for like what one forty. Yeah. Something like that. But in general, the Bombers are pretty strong against a run in the middle. But that's what you might be successful against when you have those new guys there. Yeah, there, was, yeah, there was certain games last year where it was like, oh, this I thought this team was good at the stuff in the run, and they just struggled, right? So, yeah. What do the Bombers then have to do on Thursday to beat the Owls? You want to start on offense? You want to start on defense? You want to talk about it all together? Yeah, I mean, well, I'll start. The, the biggest thing for me is going to be Montreal's defense. Right. They they ended off on a hot streak last year and they did yeah. a good great job, even great job against the Bombers in the Great Cup against that offense. So that like you said, that D line is returning Sean Lemon, uh Sankey, uh Beverett, uh Mustafa Johnson. Like guys, like th- this defense is gonna be good. Right. And then uh what's the safety's name? Why did I forget his name? Dupuy? Oh, huh? Oh, why did I how did I forget the safety's name from Montreal? I know the crazy Canadian. Oh yeah, and that, so right there, right? So it, for me, and it's going to be a good test for that new O line, with especially for Dobson uh, and Lofton, right? And then it, it, can Colin Kautsky and Newfeld and Brian do enough to help these guys to offset this Montreal D? Because that D, and especially the front seven, ran havoc pretty good on on the Bombers and the Argos in the playoffs. They have to protect Zach Caleros against Montreal on those blitzes. And you didn't mention it, and a lot of people in the media and online don't mention it, but Noel Thorpe is an underrated yes. and often not thought of coordinator who is amazing. He's going to bring crazy blitzes at the Bombers. Hopefully they've coached up Michael Chris Ike and Johnny Augustine. Not that Johnny Augustine wasn't good against a blitz, but you know, in rotation, they're going to have to have him and they'll bring the blitz. And hopefully they've really identified these positions where they need to step up and help out in the and hopefully they play a lot of that big formation, the tight end formation to really stop the momentum of that blitz and really get the running game established. You know, last year I whined and <laughs> cried and complained about not seeing enough of the heavy set. And I want to see them establish that against Montreal, especially early in the game, early in the season. Yeah, Just my- throw their might around with that O line. It's it's a lot easier for the O line to start really cohesively getting together, run blocking than it is pass blocking. When they can go forward and hit guys and really tire them out, and that's another way to slow down that blitz is smash them in the face with your O lineman and put an extra one in there. So I really hope they play the heavy sit and uh, they just really load Oliveira with the ball and play a lot of Strebler and really throw it down Noel Thorpe's face and get rid of his blitz because. They had a tough time with it in the Grey Cup. Yeah, I agree with you on Noel Thorpe. Like, he didn't get any – like, I, I know there was only a few openings this offseason with Saskatchewan and, and kind of Hamilton. Um, but, yeah, I, I think if he has another successful year with them, he'll definitely get the opportunities going into next season. The one thing pointing out is Montreal is going to come into this game fired up, right? They're Grey mm-hmm. Cup champions. They got to start on the road. They ain't happy about that. You know, mm-hmm. and I and I get it. You're playing a rematch of the Grey Cup – and you're starting on the road, which doesn't make sense to me. But that's gonna that's gonna fire them up. Sean Lemon, he's gonna be fired up because O'Shea spoke at one point of saying suspended players uh, should not be allowed to play even while on appeal or from sorry from betting on CFL games and all that. So yeah. he's gonna come in fired up to, to you know you know Sean Lemon right? Dude loves to shove it down people's throats if he can. So he'll he'll come into yeah. this game. Uh, on fire so bombers are gonna have to kind of weather the storm i think at first 
Yeah, you already skipping up to the Sean Lemon question. We're talking about should he play? I, I didn't. I don't. I didn't want to talk about that. But still, I just... you're talking about you don't <laughs> no, know no, why no, no, no. the game is being played in Winnipeg. Winnipeg will sell out with thirty thousand plus people and look good on TV. Sure, and they're trying to sell the game into the states. That's why it's being played in Winnipeg. Sure, you know but... Montreal's not going to sell out the O. Montreal's the Grey Cup champions. They should be starting at home, and there should be a rematch of this game. But it's not going to look good on TV. And you I, want a full stadium. You, and you tell, want you, it to sound good and look good on TV. You're telling me you're that's trying not, to, you're that trying to advertise the game. Montreal wouldn't be able to sell out their stadium uh, not in the a big Grey o. Cup rematch. Not the big O. Not the you're, big not, o. you're not playing at the O anyway. Not 30,000. Yeah, but they, they're still going to fit 20-something thousand, whatever they can in, that's in Montreal. It. So. Compared, to the, compared to the vibe that you're going to get in Winnipeg, like you're really trying to grow the game. So it's just like the thing about halftime, which we'll talk about. And some people's like, oh, you need a Canadian to start to be in there. No, you don't. You don't need to start in Montreal because the great cup champions if it looks better in winnipeg and you're trying to sell the game especially in america and you want a good vibe to the game put it in winnipeg best best home environment in the league now no doubt either way montreal is going to be pissed about that they're going to come in pissed about that so they're definitely going to show it and want to prove it on the field hey you want to take this game away from us you want to play it somewhere else sure we'll just come in and win for sure so it'll for be sure a tough they'll be upset that crowd the e crowd we are going to be there. We have to be loud early and often and throw a bunch of offense off that game. Oh, there's no worry about that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, about being loud. That yes, place is going to be loud. hopping. We are excited and ready to go since break up. <laughs> well, you know, don't worry. I'm going to bring my bell. It's going to be loud. So, uh, and so my to question to you then. Oh, sorry. Uh, I was, I was, go ahead. In just regards to what they have to do, they got to get in Fajardo's face to turn it around and create pressure up the gut which I guess my camera is going a little bit fuzzy right now, but I'm going to continue through it because we're talking about the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. So you'll have to deal with it with me, Blue Bomber fans. They got to get in his face in regards to that rotation of Woods and Fox, and I forget who else that we were just talking about, but they really got to crush that pocket and collapse that pocket up the gut. And it'll also help, you know, put the pressure off Shane Goche in the running game if they can really solidify the gut. So man, they got to get in Fajardo's face. And implement a blitz that'll work, and that's well timed because they got a blitz and get in Fajardo's face too. Yeah, and that blitz last year kind of in the Great Cup did not work a lot of the times where they were sending uh, extra guys and they weren't getting through to Fajardo. Um, and then plays with his legs. We saw the, what was it the first game they played last year? Fajardo with his legs was getting away from pressure, all that stuff. Had a lot of rushing yards. The second game they kind of kept him in tow. Uh, and he struggled way more than that first game. Great cup. He had he had a few opportunities to run, and he didn't, especially late in that game. So yes, they they're gonna have to keep him in check. Um, we'll see where the Montreal's um, O line has gotten because they played a very good Great Cup game last year too. So we got yeah. these new guys coming in for the Bombers. Can they cause enough havoc there? And like you said, how many nineteen out of twenty four starters? You said about twenty four, I think. That's crazy. That's what us where we were talking about almost with the bombers last year coming into that into the season, right? They yeah. should be the team that guts out of the gate quicker because everyone's kind of coming back. So Montreal may find that this year that they get out of the gate quicker as other teams are still kind of gel and figure things out. It also didn't work in the Great Cup because they didn't really blitz all year. It wasn't their thing. It wasn't their identity. And of course, you don't really, you shouldn't really call it cover zero when you're inside your own 35 yeah. with uh, any which way, <laughs> any which way. And they have to stop the Montreal run game. You know, you, you talked about maybe the run game is a bit unsteady with Steinbeck gone, but I think Fletcher is a good running back. And I think the Canadian Jesperin Antwi is a really good running back. He might be their starter come season wise. Well, I'll mention him later on. But uh, so, yeah, Shane Gauthier will still have to be on his game because I think their running game still can be dangerous. And the return game, Worthy got released, right? Yeah. So who saw? So, and he had a pretty good season. I'm just trying. I didn't check, but who is the actual receiver or uh, returner now for Montreal? You know, yeah, offhand. We'll no, I don't. I hate that there's no de uh, depth chart yet. I guess we could, you know, recording a little bit earlier, but yeah. But I mean, if if you're if you're cutting Worthy, you got another guy that's going to step up and play just as well, right? So yeah. Again, Montreal, the the Bombers special team are going to be in tough right off the bat. So we mentioned Sean Lemon. I call him Cleo Lemon. <laughs> it's like, who? <laughs> Sean Lemon playing on Thursday. Should he be playing? <laughs> no, of course not. It's already proven that he was caught gambling on CFL games and his own. And sure, 
the investigation shows that there was no evidence that the games were impacted by his wagering, but presidents, presidents, precedents have to be set. You cannot be gambling on games and your own games because you have knowledge that other people don't have. How hard is that to understand? And it's a bit embarrassing that Montreal would allow him to set that appeal and the CFLPA would put that appeal through to let it happen. That's kind of embarrassing. It's but part hey, of well, he's a great player, so it's it's part of his right to be able to appeal. Uh, to me, though, the CFL is dropping the ball by not getting into this appeal quicker. Like, what are you waiting for? Like, are you that busy that you can't hear one appeal and see what's going on? Like you say, it was proven that he bet on games. He he bet on CFL games. It wasn't he was betting on the NHL or the NFL. He was betting on CFL games. The integrity of the league is kind of at stake here too, because if we, you know, there's yes. a lot of stuff going on. NBA players are getting banned for life. Uh, baseball players getting banned for life because of betting on games. So the CFL needs to take this a little bit more seriously. And, and I, I, the, the appeal process allows him to play. So I guess he can play. But I agree with you in the, in the sense that he should not be playing. Or, and this appeal should have probably been heard a lot faster than, again, the CFL dragging their feet on this. Um, because, yeah, there is proof. Yeah. There's proof. Yeah. It's not like they're still look. investigating. There's proof. I'm not, I'm not going to let you get away on this one. I know it's his right to play, but with the process in play and the appeal being seen whenever it is or heard whenever it is, do you think he should be playing on Thursday? No, I agree that he should not be playing either, even though the appeal lets him play. Uh, like you say, the, these these points were proven uh, that he did bet on games, so he should pay some kind of discipline. And, and it's not the fact that he's playing the Bombers or anything like that. He should no, be, no matter no. who they're playing. So just so when everyone understands... Yeah, we're not worried about week one here and and Lemon going crazy. We're worried about the league and the integrity of the league and and the guy bet on the league in games he played. So come on. And oh, I'm not even start on signing players who have been gambling in other league uh, any which way. <laughs> Let's move on to bold predictions for each CFL team. Let's go from west to east. Let's start with the BC Lions. I don't know how bold it is in this one, but I think they will finish first place in the West. Yeah, I, I think, think they will. They're looking good. They have consistencies, and uh, I think they're looking a little better. Yeah, and I think uh, to kind of piggyback off that, I think Vernon Adams takes the next step to being the top QB in the CFL this season. Ooh, that's bold. That's bold. Let's move on to Edmonton. What's your bold prediction for Edmonton? I think, well, again, like you said, the other one, I, I don't know if this is bold. I think Chris Jones gets fired at some point this season. Really? Yeah. We're going in opposite directions. <laughs> uh, I think they'll have one of the best defenses in the league, and I think they'll be the crossover team in the West. So I don't think he'll be fired with them being crossover. And I think the MBT makes them uh, more competitive than they were last year. Maybe he gets fired and in the interim brings him to where you're saying. Who's that, Jerry Jackson? Who's your interim? I don't know. No, 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 no. Oh, shoot. Ah, oh, he was a coach with him in Calgary before, too. I can't remember. Uh, Winnipeg. Oh, no. Uh, Saskatchewan Rough Riders. What's your bull prediction? Uh, let's go with, I think, Corey Mace will struggle to make an impact this season. What does that mean? Like, it's, in culture-wise, in general, to make it better? Just in a wins, wins and losses column. Got you. Gotcha. Wins yeah. column, I guess, more than anything. Culture wise, yeah, yeah. I think he'll start to build something and everything like that. But okay, okay. Uh, for Saskatchewan, I got Trevor Harris will lead the league in passing yards. Too many weapons, too many yards, and maybe too many opportunities for garbage time stats. Can he stay healthy though? That's the thing. <laughs> Obviously, if he stays healthy. Uh, Winnipeg Blue Bobberners. I can't even talk tonight. I'm getting so excited about the game. Bombers. Uh, bold prediction for me, Celestin Habba will lead the team in sacks. Wow, pretty good, pretty good. Um, I'm going to, maybe not bold, but I'm going to go Brady Oliveira gets more yards, total yards this year than last year. Did you not hear Coach O'Shea? Yeah. We don't no. give a shit about <laughs> numbers. It's all about wins. All right. That's great. I love that. There's, there's, a, <laughs> there's a media guy who asked him, hey, well, do you think how hard will it be for Brady Oliveira to put the same numbers? He's like, it, 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 it's, it's not about numbers. They were shit. This is great. But it's going to be tough, too, with numbers because there's a lot of guys to feed on that offense, too, right? So, Ooh. Toronto Argos. What's Ooh. your goal prediction for them? Calgary. 
Don't forget Calgary. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Calgary, Calgary, <laughs> Calgary. Uh, Maybe it's fitting that I missed, forgot for Calgary. The Dickinson bros, they're back together or are together, I guess. Um, yeah. This will be Dave Dickinson's last year at the helm of the Calgary Stampeders. That's bold. That's bolder than me. <laughs> I say they will miss a playoffs and they'll decide to move on from Meyer. Definitely before they move on from Dickinson. He's too entrenched in their culture, man. Uh, and that's still like who's making the who's who like Huffnagel is one position ahead of him. To is Huffnagel gone now, or did Dave he's did, did a, Dickinson take over that president spot too, or no? He's a GM spot, but he's like uh, yeah. an uh, what do you call it? Um, an a senior advisor. advisor. Hmm. And there's I haven't seen anyone listed as any which way. Like there's obviously people in the admin that has president or whatever, but I don't know who's gonna fire his ass. His brother. Greg, he's going to take over. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he's a senior advisor. <laughs> Give me a break. Toronto Argos, what's your prediction for them? Cameron Dukes takes over, and the Argos move on from Chad Kelly. I think Dukes plays well enough for them to be able to move on from Kelly. Oh, yeah, for or sure. At least I hope. Cameron Dukes, uh, Toronto Argos 500 football. They'll still finish second in the East, but, <laughs> uh, but I'm not lying. But it'll be 500 football. Hamilton Tiger Cats, I have uh, Bo Levi Mitchell losing his starting job before Labor Day. Injuries, age, inefficiency. Yeah, I have it too. Actually, Taylor Power takes over from Bo Levi at some point, but can't do enough to get Hammy into the playoffs. What do you got for the Montreal Alouettes? Your bold prediction. Fajardo does not build off his Grey Cup performance, and he goes back to being regular Cody Fajardo. Yeah. Not that guy that we saw in the Grey Cup. He was all right in the Grey Cup. He wasn't that good. He didn't make mistakes, right? Yeah. And that's the biggest thing with him all the time. He makes mistakes, and he didn't do that in the Grey Cup. Or else he hits the goalpost. Yes. (laughs) Uh, We're talking about running backs. Jeff Fernandes, I think he's a a starting running back by the fourth game. I think he's the Canadian going to take over. He's a big power back, I think. Uh, and I really like what I saw from him in his spot performances last year. And he'll free up a spot in the ratio. So I, I think, yeah, they'll go with Antwi as running back. Finally, the Ottawa Red Black. See, I can't talk. Red Blacks. <laughs> the Ottawa Red Blacks are going to sweep the Argos this year. The Argos are 18-5 and five all time against the Red Blacks, and the Red Blacks have never won consecutive games against the Argos. This is the year Bobby Dice is going to do it with Drew Brown. So I'm going to take Ottawa sweeping the Argos. That's a wild stat. Um, okay, so I'm gonna say Drew Brown takes Ottawa back to the playoffs. Hey, <laughs> so what? What play do you think they're gonna be third? Yes, I, I think they could end up battling Toronto possibly, but yeah, I, I still think I, I think third. I don't know if there's gonna be a crossover this year. So, no crossover, no, no. Ooh. I have Edmonton making a crossover. Let's talk about that halftime show that Jonas. Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's 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 figure this out then. So you got the BC finishing first, Winnipeg second, probably Saskatchewan third, Edmonton, and then Calgary. Okay, yeah, and Edmonton is a crossover. All right, and I have uh, Montreal, Toronto is one two. All right, Ottawa ahead of Hamilton or Hamilton ahead of Ottawa. Oh, Ottawa is going to be ahead of Hamilton. So you're you're saying that Bobby Dice is going to survive this season. I hope he does. <laughs> I'm hoping he does. I'm not going to say that. Yeah. That is a bold prediction. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thoughts on the Jonas Brothers as the Great Cup halftime show? I don't okay. know. I mean, it's good. It's they, they were a big act. I don't know if they're still a big act. I guess the name's still pretty big, right? But, I mean, yeah. it's not, not my type of music. But, hey, if you get some more butts in the seats or people watching, I'm all for it. You You have teenagers. Herb? Yeah, I don't think they listen. Do they still to talk about Jonas Brothers? Brothers? No, never, never. Like I look at the Canadian charts, not Canadian artist charts, but Canadian charts and music that's listened to. You got, of course, Billy Irish, Post Malone. Who's Shabuzi? No idea. Kendrick Lamar. Kendrick Lamar. Like, Kendrick why Lamar. didn't they get Drake and Kendrick Lamar to do a kiss and make up, squash the beef live at the Great Cup halftime show? Like that would have brought in the world. Yeah. Drake's never done a uh, halftime show, eh? Man, they'd never bring any Urban in the halftime show. But the, the Black Eyed Peas. Whoa, whoa, whoa. They brought Keith Urban in one time. 
That's gross, brother. You know what I'm talking about. I know what you're talking about. And then just you talk about around. country. Just Give me a break. Around. Black but Eyed yes. Peas is the most urban. They. You remember Robert California on The Office? Yeah. Black Eyed Peas is rock and roll for people who don't like rock. It's rap for people who don't like rap. It's pop for people who don't like pop. That's what it is. So they need to go urban for one year. Give me a break. Give me something. Yeah, I mean, Drake, man, why not? The guy's Canadian. He's a big star. Like, when's the Great Cup in Toronto again? Soon? I haven't heard anything there, so. Bring him to Winnipeg. Oh, God. Be cold. Oh, fresh IE. <laughs> Love fresh IE. Oh, the whole Northern Touch crew. Oh, <laughs> Northern Touch. Shaw Claire Cardinal. Yeah, Cardinal's usually at the uh, Sea Bears games, or he did a couple Sea Bears la- games last year, didn't he? Sea Bears shows? two and one right now. Two yeah. and one. We're gonna have to go check out a game after their first loss. Shoot, check out a game. I can't go to any other home game I'm out of town oh, for all the rest right. of them. Oh, I might man. be able to see the Sea Bears in Edmonton go at it for the final yeah. game of the season. Nice. Any which way. What's your wave? <laughs> Way, yeah, yeah, yeah. Far too early prediction for the Grey Cup matchup, not winner or winner if you want. I don't care. Let's go BC versus Montreal. Sorry, uh, yes. Oh, well, you want me to pick what? a winner? What? Okay, go ahead, pick a winner if you want. No, I, I, <laughs> you give me your two teams first. Oh, Bombers and Alouettes. Okay, it's gonna be the rematch. All right, all right. It's going to be the rematch. I did have both of them down, but I went with BC Montreal. I'm not going to pick a winner, but if you want to pick a winner, go ahead. If I'm going to pick out of that, I'm going to go with uh, BC. Let's move on to some Winnipeg. Listen, let me just put a caveat on this. I do think the Bombers are still going to have a very good season. I'm just in the wait and see spot right now. So don't get mad at me. You don't wait and see for BC either? Hey? You're not going to wait and see for BC either? They're, they're bringing it back a lot more guys. I mean, I mean, one thing is they're losing bets. So we'll see how that defense is, right, by losing Matthew Betts. So, yeah, I know. No Marcus Sales. And no Marcus Sales. Saskatchewan. I was actually, if if he didn't sign to Saskatchewan, one of the questions I was going to ask you is, should the Bombers take a look at bringing him back? But too late They for have to be at minimal cap space. Even with the injuries aside right now, people off the roster, that's so big he must be off for at least two, three games. To free yeah. up some class space as well. It's not worth just sitting off one game. Oh, yeah, yeah. Winnipeg Jets talk. Let's do it. We uh, saw an article in regards to Winnipeg Jets fan poll by Murata Tesh in the Athletic slash New York Post. It was double posted, whatever. Um, pay double. Uh, let's. <laughs> we just want to look at the grades. Uh, let's look at that grade section before we look at the questions for other weeks ahead. Thank you, Murat, for that. It's a great, interesting conversation. Uh, we're going to look at the grades for the Winnipeg season as a whole, the forwards, defensemen, and the goaltending. Let's start with the Winnipeg season as a whole. What grade are you giving them? I'm going to give them a B. Um, obviously, great regular season, 110 points, fourth overall. Yes, they had some up and downs, um, went, some good winning streaks, some good losing streaks. Um, but the, again, 30-plus games of three goals or less. A uh, stretch there, right? So, play way better defensive hockey that that they they have in years. Uh, problem to me was the special teams, both penalty kill and power play, and then the playoffs, which probably was almost an F. So that kind of brings down the grade, but can't take away a lot from that regular season. So I'm gonna go with B. I'm gonna go with B plus. Consecutive playoffs, over 100 points, first round loss to a more experienced and deeper teams. Like you said, special teams was. A disaster. Five on five play was immaculate. Uh, Winnipeg Fords this season. I'm going to give them a B minus. B minus. Injuries and lack of consistency really in scoring. Injuries and lacking consistency in scoring really hurt them. They were great defensively and and shining on five on five play. So they get a B minus for me. Yeah, I'm going to give them a B. Their top guy was Shifley with 72 points. Uh, but only 25 goals for Shifley and Ehlers. Connor ended up with 34, even though he missed, what was it, 17 games or something like that. So 12 guys in double digits and goals. So that's that's pretty good. But again, big drop off from those top three guys. Like um, Perfetti was fourth with 38 points, which I think was almost 30 less than what Ehlers and Connor ended up with. So big drop off uh, kind of thing and not enough consistency there. So yeah, I'll give him a B. What's your grade for the defenseman? Um, I'm going to go with... 
a B. I'll give him a B. J, uh, Josh Morrissey led the way, 69 points. Stellar defensive play there. Uh, Pionk would drop this score down for me a bit. I was close to giving them the C plus, but again, they did play some very good defensive hockey, so I couldn't do that. Um, again, only allowed what was it, 196 goals total on the season, or something in that range, winning the Williams Jennings. So some rough spots on the D in, in Pionk, uh, Logan Stanley here and there, who seemed to get better, but then kind of drift off again as the playoffs came. So uh, B for me there. I'll give him a B. Morris with another strong year. Good support from Sandberg, Dylan, and DeMello. Stanley came off pretty solid at the end of the year. I think he looks like he started to figure out what his role was on the team and getting comfortable with it. I don't know if that's something that he can sustain over an 82-game season, so he might have to be comfortable with looking from the plate. Oh. Looking from the press box, Pionk was horrible. Offensive support was almost non-existent. Yeah, for me, Stanley, though, the playoffs kind of was telling how he looked. I know the whole Jets as a whole looked terrible, but Stanley and Oh, Stanford yeah, the whole really team struggled. was trash. Ugh, goodness. Goaltending this season. I'll give them an A+. Plus. Hellebuck, Brassois. I can't really, you know, Jennings. That's it. Yeah, I'll give him a B plus just because the playoff struggles did not look good. But like you say, William Jennings, trophy, probably the Vesna for Hellebuck. Great numbers, Laurent Brassois. Look great, and hopefully he'll parlay that into a um, starting job. You had posted somewhere. What grade somewhere... did you give the goaltending? Hey, what grade did you give the goaltending? B plus. This includes the playoffs as well, right? Not just the oh, regular well. season. So, well, yeah, I know, I know, I know. Hellebuck didn't steal a couple of games, but re- he really wasn't put in any kind of opportunity to steal a game, even. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, I don't know. He, he, but he didn't do a lot to help himself in a lot of those games either. I will defend the guy uh, to the ends of the earth, but there were some goals that just did not look good on him. Goals and that he probably didn't Vesna, And probably a Vesna winner and a, and a Jesna winning duo. So, that's a bit harsh. I don't know. Just say. All right. Winnipeg's, let's talk about the, you got the hat on, <laughs> the Valor. Second la- oh, I'm going to challenge some stuff sometimes. Come on now. The Valor, second last team in the league with a 2-1-5 and five record right now. Coming off a previous season of losing more than a million concerns, solutions, Bombers need to sell them to a group of people who knows, number one, how to run a soccer team. If it's not all Winnipeg people, that's fine. And they have to provide a venue that supports the environment to make an exciting environment to go to. The Princess Auto Stadium is cavernous for them. They need someone who they add seats to the U of M outdoor soccer complex, and they'll be fine. Like... It, it, the Bombers should not be running this show. I do agree on the stadium. It is too big for them, but there's really no other place to play. Like you say, you have to add uh, a lot of seats because you still want to be able to sell a bunch of tickets if you can. You don't want to limit yourself only to a few thousand seats. But to me, the, how this, much do they sell now? Under 2,000? I, I tried to, uh, I looked at the last game, didn't show the, the attendance numbers because they've only played one game at home so far this so year. Three, 3,000 seats would be fine, and that'd be a great environment as long as it's packed. And if you can fill that up on a consistent basis, then add more. Yeah, I think you kind of want more in case they make the playoffs and make a run, right? So the only problem for me this year, and they have to win this year, because you're not, you're not getting fan support unless you're consistently winning. And since they've been here, they have. So they need to start winning. And unfortunately, the thing was they started seven games on the road because the turf install and all that stuff happened and, and then training camp for the bombers and everything so they're they've only played one game at home they've yeah. they're, they're two wins and a tie in their last three so hopefully it's on the up and up but yeah they got to start winning uh and take a look at that and like you say if the bombers don't know how to bring along a soccer team and who they can trust maybe it's not wade miller maybe you got to bring in a soccer guy at the top there to kind of make this decisions for valor that's a good idea too. Bring a soccer ex- executive on there to run it. Pro- well, I'm sure they have like soccer folks. Yeah. But like in regards to marketing and brand development, who do they have running it? Is it someone aside than people who also were from the Bombers and then maybe you don't? I don't know. But look, look at the Sea Bears, right? Second season, those guys are selling out games. Like that. that's a social atmosphere when I went to the playoff game last year. It was crazy. You know, and I went to a couple of Valor games and it wasn't this same kind of thing. Yes, they have a section chanting section but like you say that stadium is just way too big uh, yeah. for everyone to get in it and every, all the fans are just on one side anyways too and you can't cut it off with a sheet like you do at the winnipeg no. arena you need Sorry, a big winnipeg sheet. arena whatever <laughs> canada life center arena place uh, let's move on to hot shots let's do it 
Stanley Cup predictions. Who do you got in how many games? Uh, your boy Pomo pulls it off and Florida wins in seven. Ooh, it's going to be a good series. I got Florida in six. It'll come down to Bobrovsky and Skinner. So I'm going to take goalie Bob and Pomo to win. How, how, how do you feel for those Calgary fans? Oh, <laughs> you either got to cheer for Edmonton or Matthew Kachuk. It's hilarious. <laughs> Uh, NBA Finals prediction. Who and how many games? I got the Mavericks in seven. Uh, Boston, I think, needs Porzingis to be the game changer. And if you need Porzingis to be the designing factor, you're done versus Luka and Kyrie. So I'm going to take Mavs in seven. I'm going Boston in six in my expert NBA opinion. Ooh, they have it too. And that's <laughs> the thing. If Porzingis with the Celtics can be a game changer, then they can definitely win in seven. I can see that happening too. Or six. Yeah. Can, I, can these games just start already? Like, what are we oh. waiting for? My God. Why? <laughs> Jeez. Stanley Cup not till Saturday. NBA not till Thursday. Like, come on. What are we doing here? They want to bleed into the CFL. Oh, let's go. No one Thoughts wants on to Just- be... Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. That's okay. That's okay. Thoughts on Justin Jefferson make a deal? Go ahead. Ooh. Four year, 140 million, 110 guaranteed. You, you knew what was going to happen, right? You knew the Vikings or somebody was going to give him that contract. So crazy contract. Let's see if he can live up to it. Uh, unfortunate for me, or for him, I mean, he has Sam Darnold and maybe J.J. McCarthy as his QBs. Yeah, good deal. Why they have a QB rookie on, uh, they have a QB on a rookie deal. That seems to be fat now since Mahomes got it all started. So get players on a QB rookie deal. Who will be on the new cover of Madden? Uh, not who will be, who should be. I'll go with C.D. Lamb. Uh, kid had a great year, and I'm going to put a cowboy on there because all those silly ass cowboy fans will go out and buy it, <laughs> even though Madden hasn't changed for 20 years. The game's not good no. anymore for people no. who've played it since day one. It's not that good. So no. I'm going to put uh, CD Lamb on there. I'm going to go with Justin Jefferson. Why not? I mean, dude just signed a huge contract, best receiver in the league right now. So why not put him on there? Did CD Lamb have a better year than Justin Jefferson last year? Yeah, but Jefferson got hurt, right? So. Shoot. You think he would have had a better year than CeeDee Lamb? CeeDee Lamb had 130-something and was 1,700 yards. If without Kirk Cousins not getting hurt, yeah, I think Justin Jefferson could have definitely challenged that. The only other receiver had a better year was Tyreek Hill. And when's he getting paid? Uh, like, he's not getting paid now? Wow, but he's, dude, he's not going to want to not be in the top. CeeDee Lamb's going to get paid, too, so we'll see what happens there. Speaking of guys getting paid... McCaffrey just grabbed the bag. Where does that leave Brandon Ayuk? It sounds like the contract structure opens up some cap space for San Francisco this year. So they got like, I think 30 million in cap space for this season. Um, So I don't think it affects Ayuk at all. To me, it'll be more about Ayuk kind of accepting a contract. That's not obviously going to be close to what Justin Jefferson got, or he should not be expecting that. Uh, But they sign him. I think there'll be a question will be, is it Ayuk or Debo after this season? It it does affect Ayuk. You might have 30 million cap this year, but you can't. The guy's not going to sign a one year contract. No, I don't. He you can't don't need... sign an extended contract with minimal space after that. They can carry over this 30 million. So even this year, he's already signed to a $15 million contract. Yes. So it won't affect this year at all, depending on how they structure things, anyways. But they can yes. carry over that 30. Like I said, it's either going to come down to Ayuk or Debo next year. I don't think both of them, if Ayuk gets a $30 million contract. Are, yeah. is going to be on this roster after this season. You said he's asking for too much earlier today. Do you think he's asking for too much? Yeah. I mean, he should probably be in that Devontae Smith range, maybe the $25 million a year kind of range, not in this Justin Jefferson range at all, or Tyreek Hill or uh, C.D. Lamb kind of. So, yeah, yeah. 25 to 30. Again, contracts to me are crazy. Wide receiver contracts are crazy. We're, we know Brock Purdy's going to Brock Purdy's gonna end up getting paid $50 million uh, even if he has just a really good season and not a Super Bowl this year, right? And there's nothing you can do about it. Or San Fran will bring in another quarterback, a late round, round draft pick, and hope for the best. You only strike lightning once on that kind of deal, right? After you made the worst trade in NFL history for Trey Lance. Yeah, but I don't. <laughs> I think it's becoming more common to find quarterbacks late in the round now because a lot of college teams are playing pro-style offense. Yes. I think that's a benefit of seeing a lot of pro coaches go to the NFL and having this trade portal or transfer portal and people being able to play these pro style offenses that these quarterbacks late and round, they're still ready to go. Yeah. At least minimally. And when you have these crazy weapons around them, then you can be competitive. Or you bring back Tom Brady. 
Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Benny, you have anything to say to our friends? Uh, you know what? Thanks a lot for listening. Don't forget, sub- subscribe, follow, and go Bombers, go. Go Bombers, go. You can't talk either. You're drunk with fun, ready for the Bombers <laughs> to play. Less than 48 hours. Heck yeah. And the words of LeVar Burton. And if you haven't watched the Netflix series, uh, not the Netflix documentary about Reading Rainbow, watch it because it's awesome. And in the words of LeVar Burton, we'll see you next time. Look at that free plug for LeVar Burton. Like he needs it from Ray and Benny Talk Sports. Maybe one day LeVar Burton will give us a plug. Is he still alive? Of course he is. What are you talking about? Just what? Sure. Just want to make sure. After Look, I he's changed it now. Imagine. <laughs> oh That's going to make the blue. I take that back. <laughs>